All right, and that brings us to the main event of today's uh, presentation. John, take it away. Thank you, Yevgen, and welcome to all from uh, not so sunny Memphis, Tennessee today. Um, did you know that there's over a thousand recorded songs with Memphis either in the title or in the lyrics? Well, if you've heard me before, you probably do know that since I mentioned it at most of the webinars that I present. Um, but today we're going to talk about uh, identifying, assessing, and instructing adult learners at educational functional level three. Uh, the previous webinar we had looked at levels one and two, and we're working our way up the English functioning levels. So, and I'm going to turn my camera off to the, just in case it is affecting load. So first I would like to uh, mention uh, the research projects that are funding this work. Uh, the first one, as you see there, is uh, helping us to fund and offer free the reading assessments and the CAPTI service that you'll be able to sign up for uh, uh, by going to that web or website. Um, and uh, another project that we started recently, uh, funded by the uh, Department of Education, that's building uh, an online reading comprehension support system for adult learners. And that you can also sign up for at our website, and that should be available soon. I'd like to thank some of the many collaborators involved here. And I don't see her name, but Hallie Smith, who some of you know, is uh, on this uh, presentation. She's our research coordinator. And if you uh, visit our website and, and use that email, she's often the one responding to you. And she's monitoring the chat and uh, as well as to feed me questions that you may have. And we'd like to thank our uh, sponsor for the research, the Institute of Education Sciences. So uh, I'm gonna go through this in a very similar structure to the previous webinar, since we did receive positive feedback for the way we approach that. And we'll start with a section about identifying different subpopulations and what you might expect in terms of how they respond to instruction. We'll then uh, do the assessing part, and we'll be using uh, the SARA, Foundational Reading Skills Diagnostic Assessment Battery, which is what you can sign up to use later uh, as the sort of organizing uh, principle. And we'll talk a little bit about what you can expect there. And I'll spend most of my time on the instructing part, that is translating the in, uh, educational function level descriptors into instructional targets. And I'll mix in insights from research and some tips and techniques. So let's start with the identifying. So this is a rough uh, description of the great equivalents you might expect for the different uh, educational functioning levels. And as we said, today we'll be looking at low intermediate. Um, as we know, you can't directly relate adult learners to the uh, developing children, but it's good to have a sort of rough metric to, to think about. So the first group I'd like to uh, bring your attention to is any adult learner who's had inadequate school reading instruction or experience. And again, there are a zillion different reasons this might have happened. They may have liked school, but they couldn't attend. They may have had motivation issues. The quality of the education instruction they got might not have been adequate. Um, but what you might see with them is that they can make rapid learning and improvement in at the level three reading fluency with a lot of practice and a slow steady increase in their vocabulary, morphology, knowledge, and their text processing. If you're working with English language learners, I would, I would temper that to say steady, continuous improvement in reading fluency. And again, that depends on their uh, spoken English fluency, as well as their uh, knowledge, developing knowledge of vocabulary, morphology, and text processing with practice. And that's especially going to be true if they were schooled, you know, at, at an adequate level in their home language. So the more, because they're 
then translating from their home language into English, but they already have a lot of the, the language capacity built up. And of course, when you're working with English language learners, you're gonna work across all four modalities, although that's always a good idea with all learners. And we'll talk a little bit more about that later. And of course, you may very well have individuals with diagnosed or undiagnosed language learning or reading disabilities. So of course, they're gonna make slower progress and they'll experience some frustration, especially if they're seeing other learners making faster progress. But there's no reason to believe they won't improve with time and, and just pace their reading practice so that it, it slowly gets easier. It never gets easy, but it'll get easier. And you're gonna to need to help them learn how and where to make more time for reading practice. And again, as you'll see in this particular session, a lot of focus on you know, higher level parts of the word level of language, prefixes, suffixes, and roots. That'll help them a lot. So a uh, quick mention of a, a volume that came out in the last year. Um, we have a chapter in it, which is what I'm highlighting here, but the entire volume edited by a colleague of mine, Dolores Perrin, it's an absolutely wonderful resource for everything you wanna know about uh, adult literacy education, uh, models, instruction, reading, writing, other areas. So I recommend it, maybe your local library. Okay, so let's talk about how you assess. This is how you both identify who's at level three and some of the characteristics of them. Now, of course, as you get to level three, you're starting to see very mixed profiles. Um, you're seeing individuals who have weaknesses in some skills and relative strengths in others emerging more, more concretely. So the Sarah Reading Battery is an instrument that I helped develop, uh, actually the, the lead author on. And it's been in development for quite a few years, started as an adult reading battery. Uh, we then developed it for use in the K through 12 levels. And now through the study you saw mentioned at the beginning, we are making sure that we have appropriate norms and that it's valid for all adult learners. And as you can see here, uh, it, um, it has multiple tests, multiple levels for looking at progress over time. Uh, it's adaptive. And of course, the completion times are all relative to the, some of those issues I said about the subpopulations earlier. Adults, un, more variability than children in how much time they take on tests. So this is the names of the six subtests. And um, all of these are appropriate for individuals at level three. Um, and this breaks out sort of how much time and how many sessions you might want to allot for different levels of learners. And again, you may not know what level of learner you're working with until you give the battery. So if it's below that, you'll see that they're taking a long time, they're taking a lot of effort. And so at level one and two, you may stop the test after the first multiple subtests. And each subtest is built to be only eight, five to 10 minutes max of time per subtest. But again, if you really don't have the skills, they take you longer, more effort, and you wear out. Uh, but you should find that at level three, they're able to complete the entire battery. And depending on how much effort or how much time they're taking, you may break it into two sessions. Say the first four subtests, or maybe the first five even, in the first session, and then the reading comprehension in the second session. This makes it a more humane session for the learners. They all have more uh, freshness when they restart and better scores or better measurement. So we don't want, we want them to have a good experience. So I'm not gonna go over all the tests. Uh, that doesn't mean that I don't think they're all important at this level, And but I'm skipping the word recognition decoding one. You can go back and look at the first webinar because we covered that much more closely there. Um, here I'm gonna show you the vocabulary test which we look at two different kinds of uh, underlying skills, uh, a wide range of synonyms, but also a whole set of items that look at the relationship between words that are topically related, like forest for the trees. And there's a lot of secondary meanings we look at too. So we're, we're looking at a, a wider range of vocabulary knowledge. This is an example of our morphology items. And here we vary the prefixes or suffixes of words and 
hold the mostly hold the root uh, steady. And they sometimes call this morphosyntactic because it's basically it captures both your meaning and the way the grammar or syntax of the sentence works. So these are examples of those. And those are very both predictive. They're good for both English language learners and native speakers in terms of building vocabulary. And right at the end of the session, I will go over some, some of that very briefly. Uh, this is an example of the sentence items. And here, again, at the end of the session, I'll go over a little bit how we use these logical and relational and discourse connectors to build meaning within sentences and then across sentences. So these are very important for different kind of text structures. And our, co our comprehension test is more traditional passage comprehension with locate and locating and finding information as well as sort of inferences within and across the text. So now I wanna spend some time on the instructing level. So again, we'll go back to our sort of uh, description of the different levels. And today we're gonna to be focusing, these are what I, you know, this is what I call the primary learning targets. There's really a lot of things that have to be covered at each level, but you, you put a lot, this is a sort of main emphasis. And you'll notice here that I sort of, uh, grayed out but kept in both the level two and the level four. Because if you've just learned to read fluently, that doesn't mean that you're done with all your fluent reading and, and developing it. And so a lot of what I'll talk about during the session will actually be about building that set of fluency into better language skills. But it's also a time when, you know, typically if you were a, a fourth or fifth grader, you'd be learning about different text structures and how to model meaning in those different things. And then as you advance, you sort of, that becomes more sophisticated into a model of, you know, learning and thinking about text at a higher, deeper level, disciplinary literacy. And we'll touch on, we won't touch on those here, but those will be coming up in a later webinar. So I like to use as an, as a, as an organizing principle, the evidence-based reading review, which makes it foundational skills in these four categories. And, now I get to the basically the descriptors of uh, the educational functioning level three. And as I did last time, I like to show you how they represent it in the actual document. Uh, they give you a big block of text that you would probably need to be at level five or six to actually interpret and make sense of the way it's here. And so what I like to do is break it into uh, the, le the different kinds of constructs that come from the reading literature that are actually all embedded in there. It's, it's actually a very strong statement. It's just they jumbled everything together. So for example, they do talk about complex word recognition and decoding. Very important at this level because you're getting longer and longer words, more academic words. And syllabification becomes an important issue because these long words are really just four or five chunks of syllables together. And that's one of the reasons morphology is so useful. And you need to be able to do that pretty easily. So otherwise, 10 letter words look like they're really hard instead of two or three chunks. Um, so that's an important area for development. Uh, reading fluency is, again, very critical at this level. And what they say here is to read fluently at the complexity of the demand of this level. And I'm going to take issue with that a little bit in this presentation, which is why I graded here. So. Keep your eye on that one. Again, they do mention morphology, roots and affixes, but they use it in the context of just decoding unfamiliar words. And I, I'm gonna push it and say, no, it's a, it's a major area of, of sort of knowledge acquisition to know the morphology allows you to apply it everywhere. So that's also something that I, I'd like to nuance change. And then they mentioned vocabulary. And again, as if it's so that you can infer meaning only from texts and only from certain texts. And again, I want to push that one because, you know, nowadays there's plenty of tools to help you to build your vocabulary while you're reading. So yes, you should have strategies from learning from text, but you should have others. Then they go on and talk about comprehension strategies. And I have no quibbles with this. This is the same way I would model them. And as you can see at the bottom, it's basically this, the last bullet there is about structures of text, which I think is important and these different kinds of relationships and summarizing and explaining. What's missing in here though, that I want to talk about more is the mediating and moderating effect of background knowledge. 
So you're going to read on familiar and unfamiliar subjects. But again, you're often going to read on things that you know about from the world, from other media, from, uh, um, from, from having experience with. And they also leave out motivation engagement, the, the, the driving the reading and what you look at through your interest or because it's relevant to your life goals and needs. Because those make you want to put more effort into what you do and sort of overcome the challenges that, that you might have because of your lower reading ability. And then uh, OMG, they go on and I resorted the set into these topics. Now, I love these topics um, because they actually map very well to work I've done before on, on reading framework. Uh, but I can't believe they put them all into level three. And we certainly won't have the opportunity to be able to go through them all today. So I'm gonna save these for a later webinar on comprehension. And it's good to actually introduce these starting at level three, because again, there are very mixed profiles. But again, I think the full maturity of these happens in level four and level five. So we'll, we'll probably take those up at the, at the next seminar. Um, just to show you, this is the framework of reading literacy that we developed as part of this large project that also spawned the work we're doing here. And so I think all the things on the previous slide fall into the two categories we call thinking conceptual and social modeling and perspective taking. And at level three, I think I'd, I'd wanna put more emphasis, at least in this webinar, on language development and text language knowledge and text and discourse. So, um, and again, I've used this diagram before to to point out that I think all the different foundational skills are built on every single um, level, but the mixture of them so uh, is different and the amount of attention or focus you put on it. So for level three, again, I'm gonna point out just putting more attention, of course, on vocabulary and fluency um, as well as comprehension. But again, in this session, we're gonna probably uh, hit the, the first two more. Okay, well then I'm gonna move on because I know I'm, I'm actually gonna run out of time as usual if I don't move quickly. So again, I've brought this up before as a way of demonstrating that at the early levels, you have all these independent skills, you have to focus on all of them until they come together. But as you get into levels three and four, they're starting to intertwine with each other and work together in synchrony. And, and so you, you're actually able to build the sort of the knot area here, you're tightening the knot of the set of the word level skills and the language skills to work together. So now I'm gonna push on this issue of fluency and I'm gonna give you a, a heuristic here, mnemonic. It's not a model, it's not, it's just me trying to help you to, to think about these things and organize the next section. So AAA squared is, is not something you're gonna find on, on the internet. Uh, it's, it's just a way of explaining things. Um, okay, so, if you're at level three, reading in or during your class time is not enough to get you all the way through. So you're gonna to wanna to help learners to identify or make time for reading in their daily, weekly, non-class schedule. I don't care where this is, uh, but you can be co commuting to work if you're not driving, I hope, coffee breaks, lunch, waiting rooms for social services, the doctor's office, First thing in the morning, last thing at night, it's okay to fall asleep while you're reading. I do that all the time. Uh, take any TV show or any media you watch and carve a little time out for text. And of course, if you can start becoming regular and moving to your local library, it's the best place in the universe for developing reading. Uh, I don't care what devices you use. Smartphones are great because they're, they're, they have a lot of opportunities. If you can get hold of a Kindle or e-reader, they're not that expensive anymore, uh, tablet or iPad even better. And, and as a last resort, there's still paper-based reading material, books, magazines, newspapers. I, I, I say that I love reading books still and I get them out of the library, but I, I think there's so much benefit to the digital and there's so much presence that I, I, I almost prefer that, that they figure out a way to use digital media. Uh, and then what you want from all of this is that there's a habit formation, a habit of looking at text on some sort of routine level, daily, weekly, a little bit of time, it, but make, it becomes a habit to be looking at text because that's gonna be very important. 
Now, the anything is the one I kind of added to the anywhere, anytime. Now, children learn to read like when they're, you know, third to fifth grade, they become lifelong readers because they get hooked on books or stories and they're curious about the world. But adults can't go back to third and fifth grade sensibilities. Most of them can. Um, so they should be able to read what they want and need. And, and this basically, because they have to learn and use adult vocabulary and language. So it has to be based on their relevance or interests in all these different domains that are important to their lives. That's what's gonna use the background knowledge and that's what's gonna use the motivation. So I'm saying don't worry too much about text difficulty or deep comprehension. Um, Yes, there's a limit, but they'll find it too. But if they feel like struggling because they need to know something, because they have background knowledge, it's a great equalizer in a text. Um, if you know, they'll, there's vocabulary in our oral language every day that we're getting exposed to, like all the words you see here that you now get to see in print, and that helps you to build your knowledge of print reading. Um, you can use your knowledge of the world to make inferences about the things you're reading for words you don't know. And interest and curiosity allow you to engage and persist even in challenging text and challenging content. And, it, and you have reason to want to learn the vocabulary, the, the tools. And now digital technologies, you can always Google or look up something you don't know in a way, in a form, and maybe even with voice support that, that'll help you. So I'm pushing to let them read any and everything. Um, teen fiction, I actually read a little bit of it. it the, the good news is the vocabulary is very easy and it's not very dense text. So if you can handle it, social media is fine. As long as there's text to read, uh, Facebook is the only social media not correlated with literacy, I think, in a recent international study. So, you know, it's got to be a reading media and you want to encourage them to get longer and longer texts that they're reading. So definitely moving towards books because you're feeding the system and the more you feed it, you know, the better it'll get. And I'll get to that in a moment too. But, you know, there's a uh, download Libby or any of these text reading apps onto your phone or your material. It, it hooks you into the library. Now you can download eBooks. Um, I, you know, I have these, uh, this one I love. It's a, a reading list app. So what you do is you can scan the back of your library book, the barcode, and all the information pops into the thing about the book, the length, the information, the cover, everything. You then can say when you started, you can click on a button to tell when you finished it. You can bookmark how far you in, you can keep notes. And this gives you this sense of accomplishment because you get this whole list. Now I use it because I do read a lot and I forget what I read. And this reminds me a month or two months later that this book I took out of the library is one that I had actually taken out before and read half of or three quarters or whatever. It's a great free opportunity. Um, get to the point, you know, I think at this level where you can watch TV with the sound off um, and keep up with the, the captioning. That's a good way to see if your fluency is keeping up with real life speech. And you should be able, you'll, you'll miss some of the visuals, but if it's talking heads, you know, you're, you're basically getting the, the text. And of course, use the emerging technologies like CAPTI provides. They provide speech to text and learning activities, all these things to support uh, learners who have trouble with text and take advantage of those to build up this, this ability. So next one is reading aloud. And so why? Well, I did a study some years back, a national study, and you can see the data here, the lowest level learners, 84% of them read less than 90 words per minute. I am talking to you at at least 125 to 150 words a minute. 90 is too slow for reading. You don't wanna read slower than you listen. You wanna get it up to that speed. Nearly half of the uh, basic level readers are reading very slowly, lower than 90 words. So we're trying to pick up the pace. Why? Um, well, here's another why. So your local news anchor, these are two of our Memphis areas. They look you straight in the eye in the camera and they read text off of a teleprompter with accuracy, average speaking rate, so we all understand, and expression. They may have seen it once before the show started. They're just, they use a standard English dialect. Now, I don't know how they speak when they go back home to their neighborhoods. There's di every neighborhood in the United States has a different dialect accent. 
but they minimize that so that they're speaking a standard English. And this is useful. It's called code switching. And it's useful though for reading development because it, it maps the sight to sound a little bit more than, you don't have to speak without an accent or without a dialect. You have to be able to hear the difference and, and kind of that'll help you. That's been shown to be uh, correlated with your reading. Uh, individuals who learn how to sort of hear this difference also learn to decode and read a little bit better. The more important thing is that you're hearing yourself speaking. I, I, that's not the big point. I didn't want to make that the big point. The point is you hear yourself speaking. Why? Because this is what the science is about. Uh, the si silent and oral reading fluency is defined as accuracy, pronouncing the words and activating the meaning, which is building your decoding and word recognition, your vocabulary, reading rate, because the normal rate is of, an, of a silent reading is at least 150 to 250 words. This makes it easier. You get more done per unit time, less effort. You fall asleep less often. Intonation helps you with language and fluency and syntax and written discourse. So, and here's an instructional tip. Automatic speech recognition has been getting much, much better, as you may know from talking to Siri and others. So you can download an app. So they can be reading from a book, but also have an app running so that as they speak, it's turning their speech into text. And then they can look at the text and see whether they were accurate in comparison to the book, or they can reread until they are and see if they're fluent, see if the app recognizes their standard English. So there's there's definitely tools out there now for reading aloud. And it's, it's, and it's a professional activity, at least for uh, broadcasters. So last, automaticity, that's the goal of all of this work. You're basically, if it's easier to pronounce words, you can activate the meanings. The speed is the speed that you want to be able to process at. And if you can do these things, you then you have to give less attention to the words on the page. And the definition of automaticity means you can do more than one thing at a time, which means you read the print without thinking about the print. And then you focus on comprehension and making meaning because you're not being interfered with by the fact that you're decoding it. If it's easy, rapid, and effortless, then you can read more, which builds your vocabulary and language skills, which then allows you to get to more com complex comprehension strategy instruction, which may actually require some effort on your part. So that's why you want to do this at level three, because you don't want to wear them out giving them deep comprehension when they can only read about uh, 300 words before they get worn out. So we're getting near the end here. So a quick little return to some of the language comprehension skills that I promised earlier. And I'm going to do a, a last couple minutes on vocabulary, the morphology part, and the discourse sentence connectors. And next time I'll pick up probably a little bit more there. Um, one of my colleagues likes this piece that I've done in other presentations about morphology, teach a person the word fish, and they'll know the word oh, fish. Teach them the structure of words, and they'll know a school of fish. They'll know inflectional, past, plural, tense. In English, it's pretty simple. But for English language learners, it's very important. It tells you whether things happen now or in the past or in the future. But derivational is the big one because it transforms words and takes a single word you know and makes it into a dozen words you might be able to use. And of course, even though technically metaphor is not part of morphology, it, it again makes you think of words as having both literal meanings and figurative meanings. So here's a new one. How morphology can add years to your grade level. So what you're seeing here is in the parentheses is the year, the grade level where these words usually emerge as sort of known by learners because they're seen more in text. So you can see in the first row, in fourth grade, you can you learn like depend. But by sixth grade, you start to learn the word dependence. And then by 10th grade, you got interdependence. Sixth grade, you know nation or national. But by eighth grade, you learn words like international and so on. So you can see just using these prefixes plus suffixes is basically expanding the level of your vocabulary, all building on basically words that hopefully you, you know the roots of or you know the simple versions of. Very critical, important. I think this is one place where, say, Spanish speakers in some languages have an advantage because they have languages that have very complex, longer morphological terms, and many of those are cognates in English. So they end up being 
quite comfortable with long words that have multiple parts. And we have to make sure our native speakers sort of get this point too. And so I'm gonna end on discourse connectors very briefly, just to mention that these are, you know, how you bring a word, the word and the language together, because these words connect parts of sentences and discourse in a way to tell you what the meaning's all about. And next time we'll take up more, more information on how these help you to understand what text structures you're looking at and therefore how you should interpret the entire text in terms of that structure, uh, whether it's an explanation or a problem solution or a compare contrast text or story. These words help cue you into both what kind it is and how you should build the meaning of it. So this is a repeat from last time because I think these are still good points. Um, work the verbal as well as the visual channel when you're teaching reading, because you need to develop both and you need to bring them together. Uh, so listening while learning to read, viewing the print is a very, I think important and powerful thing for adults because they need to develop the language and thinking of an adult. And you can't, if you simplify the text, then it's no longer the language they use every day. They need to use uh, oral and print vocabulary together. They need to use graphic organizers and build their background knowledge through different kinds of programming. Um, and again, it, the, the nice thing is if you can give them control over those, you know, whether they have TVs or other things where they can stop and start, that's learning time, opportunities. Um, and again, always making things interesting. And then my last note is just to remind you again that at every level, you they may be compensating with some skills for others. And while those are helping them to function at the level they're at, they're not helping them to grow to the next level. Uh, and finally, I mean, I love my tests, but it's, I would not want to see my test as the first thing that an adult gets when they enter a new learning program. Give them some time to get goals set, get oriented, feel comfortable, don't, don't send them straight to a test. Um, and, and again, look at, look at the profile of things to be sensitive to these different profiles. All right, thank you. Hope, hope I was clear. Uh, looks like I'm close to on time for my expectations. And uh, if you have any questions, uh, you know, please put them in the chat and hopefully Hallie or Brian will uh, speak up now and let me know. So we did have one question that you happened to basically answer um, almost immediately after it was asked. But the one question that came up was, do you think having students read aloud offers any different benefits from reading silently? I do. I think that when you read aloud, you can hear whether it sounds right in your own ears. As I said, you can also record it. You can, you can ensure that you're getting every word. When you're reading silently, you have the sort of internal opportunity to skip words you don't know rather than sounding them out completely or not notice that you you sort of changed the ending of a word which caused confusion later because you thought it happened to somebody when it happened about you know or over you know some other kind of little switch and so and i think again that the, the sort of written language is not the same as as spoken language it, it has different structures, different syntax. There's much more nominalization, they call it, right? T-I-O-N endings, we don't speak that way. And so by saying it out loud, you're hearing it out loud, you're reinforcing the connection between those printed words and the sounds of them. And so I really think it, and, and again, if you, if you tend to be sort of a little bit isolated in your community and the, the general uh, speech patterns there, completely understandable to everybody there, perfectly legitimate English usage, but it's not going to help you when you read English that takes a different form and format. So I, I think I, I, I am pushing it. I am stressing it. I think it's important. You do eventually have to read well silently. Don't get me wrong, but going too soon to silent is, is I don't think is beneficial. Thank you again to CAPTI for uh, giving me the uh, platform.
Thank you again, John, for doing a wonderful presentation. And we're looking forward to the next webinar.